Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. After facing heavy criticism, Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has canceled an appearance at an event honoring the late Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who was assassinated 25 years ago this November. The organizer of the event, Americans for Peace Now, had said that AOC will, quote, reflect on fulfilling the courageous Israeli leader's mission for peace and justice today in the U.S. and Israel, unquote. But that is not how Palestinians remember Yitzhak Rabin's mission and legacy. Rabin played a personal role in the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And 40 years later, as the Israeli defense minister during the first Palestinian Intifada, Rabin ordered Israeli soldiers to brutalize and kill Palestinians protesting the Israeli occupation. And although he is known as a leader who tried to make peace with Palestinians, the actual legacy of Rabin's so-called Oslo peace process is one of continued occupation and illegal settlement expansion. Well, before the news broke that AOC was backing down from this appearance in the face of Palestinian-led criticism, I spoke to Ali Abu Nima, co-founder of the Electronic Intifada. His latest piece is called, Why is AOC Honoring an Israeli War Criminal? Ali, welcome to Pushback. As we are speaking, AOC has just tweeted that she is reevaluating this invitation and that her team uh, may have been misled on the nature of this event. But regardless of what happens there, what is your response to the fact that her team or her pers herself personally accepted this invitation? Well, first on the news that she is reconsidering, I believe she tweeted that uh, she claims that her staff was misled or that the event was presented to them differently. I just have to say I'm very skeptical about that because uh, they have to have told her that this was a memorial event for Yitzhak Rabin. That's a big deal for peace now. And uh, signing up for any event honoring Yitzhak Rabin, no matter what the details uh, of how it was described, is really outrageous because, uh, you know, behind the myth of Rabin as a peacemaker is the reality that he was a war criminal who never uh, regretted uh, for a day in his life the crimes which he committed, including the crimes he personally committed. And that includes in July of 1948, signing an order to expel all the men, women and children from the cities of Lidda and Ramle in central Palestine in what is now Israel. Uh, and that order that he signed was carried out with exceptional brutality. There's a reason Palestinians call, call it the Lidda Death March, because so many people died, uh, including uh, 120 at least who are massacred inside uh, a mosque in Lidda where they had gone to seek shelter. And even some of the Israeli uh, fighters, the perpetrators uh, of this, have described the brutality that they carried out. And this was all on Rabin's order. And none of those Palestinians have ever been allowed to go back to their homes or receive any justice or even recognition for what Yitzhak Rabin did to them. And during the first intifada, I should note that, uh, you know, I'm highlighting a couple of the most notorious uh, uh, episodes in Rabin's career. But uh, Rabin was prime minister twice. He was prime minister in the 1970s. Uh, he was defense minister. He was prime minister again in the 1990s. So this is someone who has a lot of Palestinian and Lebanese blood on his hands. And in the late 1980s, during the first intifada, the uprising in the West Bank and Gaza, an unarmed uprising against, at that time, 20 years of military occupation, Rabin publicly ordered Israeli troops to use might, force, and beatings. And Israeli troops were given orders uh, by senior commanders under Rabin's uh, authority to break the bones of Palestinian kids. And I remember as a teenager growing up, I was, I was uh, uh, 17 years old at that time. And it was shocking when the images were flashed across TV screens because in those days, believe it or not, we didn't have cell phones. 
People didn't have video cameras. So for something like this to be caught on camera was truly extraordinary. And the video, which I included in my article, of two young 17-year-old Palestinians, Wael and Osama Jawad, being held on the ground while Israeli soldiers hammer at their limbs with rocks to break their limbs is something I will never forget. Did Rabin ever face justice for that? Did he ever express regret for that? No. And then let's talk about the supposed peace legacy that uh, this event is supposed to commemorate of Rabin. Rabin has this huge image in the West of being a peacemaker with the Palestinians because he signed the Oslo Accord with Yasser Arafat. Talk about the reality of that and the difference between the, the supposed legacy he has and the reality on the ground. Right. Well, remember the first intifada that I, we were just talking about started in 1987 and the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993. The first intifada had cost Israel dearly in terms of its international image because of the sheer brutality Israel used. Palestinian kids, Palestinian teenagers and young people and sometimes older people were being killed on an almost daily basis by the Israeli army in cities, towns, and refugee camps across the West Bank and Gaza. And this was costing Israel dearly. So Israel needed a so-called peace process to uh, try to improve its image. And that's what Oslo was exactly. It was never about peace. It was never about ending the occupation. It was about starting a process that would neutralize international criticism, that would... Um, allow Israel to divert all the criticism into support for the so-called peace process. And you remember the Israeli prime minister at the start of the peace process, Yitzhak Shamir, uh, this was in around 91 or 92, said, you know, what I would have done is just started negotiations and then we would have carried on, uh, you know, negotiating for 10 years and building settlements at the same time. And Shamir was supposed to be the right winger. And then Rabin came in and signed the Oslo Accords, and he was supposed to be the alternative that embraced peace. But the reality was that Rabin himself said in 1994 that he would never accept a Palestinian state. Rabin himself continued to build settlements all across the occupied West Bank. That wasn't uh, a, a liquid prime minister. That was Yitzhak Rabin. And when he was assassinated in 1995, by Yigal Amir, an Israeli right-wing uh, right winger, more from the Benjamin Netanyahu camp, it wasn't because he made peace. Uh, it was because the Israeli right isn't prepared to even recognize Palestinians as humans. And for them, even uh, allowing the creation of a Palestinian authority as uh, an auxiliary police force for the Israeli occupation as it was, uh, was was far too much. So there's been this myth constructed that had Rabin lived, the peace process might have been successful, the Oslo process might have been successful. But that that is delusion. Rabin was on the same collision course with the Palestinians and with reality that ever, of every other Israeli leader because he did not believe in ending the occupation. He did not, not believe in a Palestinian state. And uh, he uh, was continuing the same policies that, that uh, always carried on. But above all, this is a man who never expressed any regret uh, for his crimes, dating back to 1948, was never held to account, was never brought to justice. So the very least we can do now is make sure that his crimes are not forgotten and make sure that the lives he destroyed are not erased from history and make sure that he is not falsely portrayed as a peacemaker and let alone someone on a mission for peace and justice as Americans for Peace now is outrageously and falsely claiming. Yeah, it's interesting and it comes at a moment where here in the U.S. there is a reckoning with a racist violent past. We've seen all these statues being pulled down of figures who were involved in attacks on indigenous people, slavery, and AOC has supported those protests. 
So it's interesting to see her taking part in an event honoring a war criminal, just a, a war criminal overseas in Israel against the indigenous people of, of Palestine. But let me ask you more about Rabin's role as a peacemaker, because to me, it's at the heart of this myth about him. And by the way, it's not just him. It's not just people like Ali Abunima who've been pointing out that Rabin never believed in a Palestinian state. Shlomo Ben-Ami, the former foreign minister of Israel, uh, has said very publicly that Rabin never intended for there to be a Palestinian state in the occupied territories. It was, it was an exercise in make-believe. The Palestinians uh, didn't even mention self-determination, so a, a leader like Rabin could have thought that, okay, we will have an agreement that will create something which is a state minus. This, is, this was Rabin's expression. He never thought this will end in a full-fledged Palestinian state. What Rabin envisioned was basically this Bantustan state where the Israeli settlements stay and a Palestinian collaborationist force, the Palestinian Authority, is essentially bought off to provide quote-unquote security. And let me read Ali a quote for you and ask you to respond. This is what Rabin said when he was speaking to skeptics of the peace process in the 1990s. He said this, quote, the Palestinians will be better at establishing internal security than we are. They will not allow appeals to the Supreme Court and will prevent groups like the Association for Civil Rights in Israel from criticizing the conditions there. They will rule by their own methods, freeing, and this is most important, the Israeli soldiers from, do, from having to do what they will do. Yeah, that's, I mean, Rabin is described, you know, Palestinian, the Palestinian critique of the Oslo post press, peace process has always been that this is about subcontracting Palestinians to do the dirty work of colonialism, to do the dirty work of military occupation. And there you have it from Yitzhak Rabin's mouth. And that was the plan all along. But, you know, there's nothing remarkable about it because every single co uh, colonial regime has tried to do the same thing. South Africa, which you referenced, tried to do the same by setting up the so-called Bantustan, allegedly independent uh, black ruled states that everyone knew were a sham. Uh, and of course, uh, every colonizer tried to recruit local collaborators to do its dirty work. And that's exactly what the Oslo uh, process was. And, and there is Rabin saying it very, you know, much more clearly than I could. And let's talk. And oh. I just, yeah. Oh, go ahead. And just sorry to go back to your earlier point about AOC. I think it's important to call out the absolute hypocrisy of saying that here in the U.S. we have to question, you know, that we, we can't have any sacred cows. I mean, we have to question all the so-called founding fathers, even Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, who is revered as a founding father because of the reality, the history that nobody can deny that this man was uh, enslaved other human beings and raped the people he enslaved. That's the reality of Thomas Jefferson. And so people are bringing down statues uh, because we want to have a reckoning with our history. So it's absolutely hypocritical and incomprehensible that AOC would go along with one of the, with the whitewashing of one of the brutal founding fathers of uh, the apartheid state of Israel. And let's talk about AOC's trajectory. During her primary campaign, you know, she was embraced by leftists. I donated to her campaign. I was very excited about it. I thought that my impression was, or my hope was, that she was going to be um, principled when it comes to the issue of Palestine. But after she got elected, she started backing down a little bit when she was questioned about her views on Israel-Palestine during an interview. She sort of, instead of defending Palestinian rights she sort of said that she doesn't know much about the Middle East and is not an expert, sort of backtracking. And then there was this incident where she tweeted about having spoken to Jeremy Corbyn, the, lead, the then leader of the British Labour Party, outspoken proponent of Palestinian rights. And then uh, somebody tweeted at her about how offensive it was to them as a Jewish person that she had spoken to Jeremy Corbyn and this person called Jeremy Corbyn an anti-Semite, which, you know, as as you've talked about, Ali, was, and I've talked about too, was essentially a smear campaign to destroy Corbyn's progressive movement and to destroy his advocacy for Palestinian rights. 
And AOC, instead of uh, standing up to that, essentially backed down and said that she would uh, speak to people, hear people's concerns, and refused to defend Jeremy Corbyn. And we never heard anything more about that ever again, as far as I know. So what is your sense overall about AOC's commitment to Palestinian rights and just the context in which that takes place, where you have progressive politicians with a not stellar record of standing up for minimal Palestinian rights? Yeah, well, one thing to say is, you know, I, I don't know what the reasoning was for why AOC um, signed up for this uh Americans for Peace Now gala honoring Rabin and Americans for Peace Now, despite the nice sounding name, is an, is an Israel lobby group, albeit a liberal Zionist one, as opposed to, a, you know, a hard right Zionist one. But, you know, as we've discussed for Palestinians, it's, it doesn't make a lot of difference whether have, you have Yitzhak Shamir leading Israel or Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, there were two sides of the same coin. But in the context of contemporary American politics, uh, you see a lot of people who are sort of leftish or liberal and who want to be a bit critical of Israel gravitating towards these liberal Zionist groups to, to in, a, in a way to signal like, yeah, I'm a little bit critical of Israel. But they really are uh, uh, still affirming uh, anti-Palestinian beliefs and positions by signing up to these liberal Zionist groups. And what it tells me is that AOC is not really listening to Palestinians, is not really paying close attention to what's going on, and was interested perhaps in some kind of political signaling that allowed her to say, look, I'm pro-Israel without being too anti-Palestinian. And I think in 2020, uh, when people really want to have truth and honesty from politicians, that kind of Clinton, Clintonian triangulation that uh, um, AOC was trying has backfired. The other thing I, I want to say, I think this is a lesson for all of us, and I, and I keep saying this, is politicians, no matter how much you like them, no matter how good they sound, they're not your best friend. They're not your cousin, they're not your auntie, they're not your uncle. They are politicians who are seeking power, power over you and me, and power to affect our most fundamental rights and interests, which means we have to be very strongly critical of them all the time. That's the way politicians move their positions or, or, or hold on to strong positions. It's not by standing them and saying, yes, queen, and all this kind of nonsense. You have to hold them accountable. And that goes for AOC, it goes for Bernie Sanders, it goes for Rashida Tlaib, it goes for any of the politicians who have been elected to the legislature of the American empire. We have to hold them accountable. I want to try to end on a positive note and just say that I don't think a controversy like this would even have been possible, say, 15, 20 years ago. I remember when Hillary Clinton made some vague words of support for Palestinian statehood when she was first lady, and I stress very vague. She had to apologize for that and backtrack. So you couldn't even advocate for a Palestinian state back in the 1990s. Now you have AOC agreeing to speak at this event for the supposed you know, liberal peacemaker, and now she feels compelled because of political pressure, the kind you're talking about, to reassess. And we'll see what she says and we'll update our story with whatever the result is of her reassessment of this decision. But I do think it speaks to the, the power and the impact that the Palestinian solidarity movement has had on U.S. domestic politics. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that is positive. Uh, that, But what, why is that? It's because people at the grassroots, you know, refused to uh, back off what is right. In other words, we shifted the ground towards us instead of shifting towards where mainstream politics was. And that's the only way you make change. If you think you're going to make change on Palestine or on healthcare or anything else by, you know, putting your finger in the wind and saying, oh, you know, the, the mainstream will only accept you know, Mitt Romney's health care plan right now, so that's all we can push for, then you're never going to get health care for people. And the same is true on Palestinian rights. If we're only pandering 
to, uh, you know, liberal Zionists who are as racist when it comes down to it against Palestinians as the, the Israeli right. Of course, you're not going to be doing anything to advance Palestinian rights. So, yes, the positive lesson is the ground is shifting, hasn't shifted far enough because people at the grassroots are pressing for that and they're sticking by their principles. And we just need to keep doing that. Ali Abunima, co-founder of the Electronic Antifada, his latest article, Why is AOC Honoring an Israeli War Criminal? Thank you. Thank you, Aaron.